I, I really don't know how to give this talk today. After listening to so many inspirational speakers, I'm a boring old professor of chemistry, and I could easily send you all to sleep if I wanted to by talking about hardcore chemistry. So what I want to do today really is not talk chemistry. There's a few structures in my talk, but you can ignore most of them. What I want to talk to you about is the vision that we are trying to develop in terms of how to actually make drugs for Africa. So if we are sick, we all go to the pharmacy and buy some drugs in a box off the shelf. Or if you're a bit more ill, you go to the doctor for a prescription. The question is, is where do these tablets actually come from? The name Aspen down the road has been discussed on several occasions today already. And if you ask somebody walking down the street what Aspen does, they'll tell you that it's a pharmaceutical company. The correct word really is that they're a formulation company. What Aspen does, and the other companies that are listed on that list as well, is essentially buy in the white powders, the drug substances, the APIs, the active pharmaceutical ingredients, the bit that makes you better, principally from China or India, and convert those powders into a drug that you, as a patient, can take to make you better. Depending on where you look, you'll get a slightly different number. But roughly speaking, South Africa in 2021 spent approximately 3 billion US dollars importing pharmaceutical products. And we are lucky that we've got companies like Aspen that do the final part of the processing. If you've got to actually buy those tablets in themselves from overseas, it costs even more. So are we getting our money, our value? out of that three billion US dollars. In 2015, the famous man Bill Gates was in South Africa at the International AIDS Conference in Durban. And the following morning, I happened to be on the Comair flight, if you remember what that is, going up to Joburg. And this was the headline on the newspaper which said AIDS drug stockouts cast long shadow. And it said that this year's AIDS conference has been more about what's missing than what's been achieved. And during that meeting, people went around clinics doing a survey. And 20% of the country's clinics had run out of AIDS drugs. So imagine that a patient takes a taxi uses all their money to get to the clinic to collect their supply of drugs, and they get there and there aren't any. And so for a very long time, for the 10 years that I've been in South Africa, people have been talking about challenges of global supply chains. But good grief, over the last two years, when the pandemic hit, the whole challenge of supply chains became even worse. There's also concern about the quality of drugs. Now, I'm very pleased to say that South Africa has very stringent quality control processes, and any tablets that you take are good. But I was at a meeting a few years ago where somebody said that in Ghana, 70% of the drugs that were imported were out of specification. Can you imagine that your child is sick? What do you do? Do you not give them a drug and hope that they'll just get better? Or you give them something that may contain toxic impurities? So my message today, and what I want to talk to you about, is can we establish drug manufacturing capability here in South Africa, for Africa, and ideally at lower cost, to make drugs more affordable to every single citizen. The question is, how can we do this? Or how do we not do it? This is a photograph of a chemistry laboratory taken in 1931. This is a photograph of a chemistry lab taken today. And the question is, spot the difference. 
I, I do this competition with students, and they say, ah, that guy in 1931 had a tie-on in the lab. That doesn't happen anymore, I assure you. But the key message is that the way that chemistry is taught today at university is exactly the same as it was taught a century ago. And what happens when somebody discovers that a specific chemical white powder is a good drug, all that happens is that the way that the pharmaceutical industry make it is to just take huge big pots, 1,000 litre, 5,000 litre, and boil the chemicals together to make the product. It's not always safe. There are accidents. When you speak to people in the pharmaceutical industry, they'll tell you that about 10% of batches are out of spec and need to be thrown away, so it's unsustainable. Is this what we want to do in South Africa if we are starting from scratch? So why is chemistry so slow moving forward? Let's think about computer technology. That photo on the left-hand side is a computer from 50 years ago, which would have filled this room. Now the cell phones that every single person in this room has in their pocket is tiny and more powerful than that original computer. So when you look at technology, things have often got smaller and got more powerful. So can chemistry adopt a similar sort of strategy? And so you hear various terms for this. Some people will call it miniaturizing chemistry. Some people will call it lab on a chip. The photograph that you see in the middle of that slide there is what I'm holding up in this room. It's essentially a microscope slide with channels etched into it and you can pump your chemicals into that device to do a chemical reaction rather than using a test tube to make a particular product. And there are a huge number of advantages. You get your product in higher yield, so it costs less to manufacture, it's a much safer process, etc., etc. And over the last few years, some of the big pharmaceutical companies have started adopting this type of approach. There's a photo there of a plant that GlaxoSmithKline built in Singapore to manufacture some asthma drugs. Now, what we want to do is make known medicines. As was commented on earlier on, they're all out of off patent. They're generic medicines. We want to make lower-cost products. Is anyone else in the world doing it? COVID has really made people think differently. I commented earlier on that COVID has shown us the, the supply chain challenges and the need to manufacture chemicals yourself. We all know Mr. Trump's opinion of the Chinese. And so during COVID, he gave one American company 350 million US dollars. And that company is called Flow. And Continuous, which is a spin out of MIT in Boston, another 70 million dollars. And the vision was simply to produce generic medicines themselves to stop those products having to be imported from China. The key is that microtechnology flow processing is the core technology being used in all cases. Why? Because it is now well established with many, many business cases that you can manufacture your desired product with a 20 or 30 percent cost saving. So is this a logical way of doing drug manufacturing in Africa. Let's go back to the example of the shortage of AIDS drugs that I was talking about earlier on. We all know that the vast majority of AIDS patients are in sub-Saharan Africa, about 70% of them. And Interestingly, the number of patients with AIDS is actually going up. A, because there's new infections, but B, because of better treatment, people are living longer. So the volume of drugs that you actually need is actually going up, not down. So this makes good candidates to initially start evaluating, can we do it on the continent? AIDS, however, is actually a very complicated disease to treat. No single drug is used to treat a patient. 
All patients are given what's called a triple dose, which is a mixture of three different drugs, and there are 14 of them. So if you're going to satisfy the requirements, it's not just a matter of producing one drug, you need to produce quite a few of them. Now, what we've done over the last 10 years is develop routes to seven of the 14, all using this continuous flow approach. And some of them, with work of my colleagues in the Innovation Office, have been patented within the university. So the vision is end-to-end -end manufacturing. So what you develop is an automated system. I always say it's a bit like your children's Lego. You've got different colored blocks that do different unit operations, and you join them together to manufacture your drugs in real time. Now, with the lamuvidine and emtricitabine case, there's one big challenge. One of the starting reagents that you need is a specific chemical called fluorocytosine, which itself is an antifungal medicine, and it's really expensive. You're looking at $100 a kilogram. It's too expensive to go into the drugs. There are very few suppliers of it only in China. Now, conveniently, somebody who I happen to know personally in the UK a couple of years ago developed a one-step route to produce this drug by reacting cytosine, which is dirt cheap, with fluorine gas. Now, fluorine is dangerous, but fortunately, as a result of the nuclear industry in South Africa, Pelchem in Joburg has excellent experience in producing fluorine. So what we've done is to work with two companies, a spin-out in South Africa, Mzizi Pharmaceuticals, and a company in Austria to design a production plant to produce this drug, fluorocytosine, that then we can directly take that material into other AIDS drugs. So in my lab, students work in a traditional university fume cupboard with small lab-scale plants to produce a kilogram of material. Mika and Nova have desi designed these skids, which are just movable, and you can put whatever modular structure you want to. And we have already designed a full plant to actually start manufacturing this. And if this is implemented, which I believe it will be in the next year or two, this will be the first locally produced AIDS drugs on the continent, which will be absolutely fantastic. <laughs> now, I, I, I quite like this sort of statement for a couple of reasons in terms of final thought. In the EU state of the address in 2018, Jean-Claude Jean Juncker, the then president, said, to speak of the future, one must speak of Africa. And went on to say, by 2050, one quarter of the population will be on this continent. But then, what I have problems with is he said, Africa does not need charity, it needs true and fair partnerships. That I 100% agree with, but as a European, I still, as yet, do not believe that that completely happens, and it's important that it does. So, in conclusion, what we are trying to do is drug manufacture here in South Africa, lower the cost by using innovative approaches to manufacturing. You can create a whole new pharmaceutical industry that will guarantee supply chains hopefully reduce the cost of the medicines and ultimately improve the health of the citizens of this country and the continent. And speaking in this session, of course, where entrepreneurship is important, there's an opportunity here for students to start small chemical companies, to make chemical intermediates that could feed the supply chain, etc., etc. It's really quite a lot of opportunities. Now, in this talk, I've had very little time, and you're not a chemistry audience anyway, 
But it's not just AIDS drugs. We've done a variety of cancer drugs, diabetes drugs, TB, malaria, et cetera, et cetera. You can't just focus on one particular area. But by far the most important slide that I have to do as an academic is to thank the students in the lab who have had a particularly difficult time over the last two years trying to do research under exceptionally difficult conditions. But what I must say is I sometimes feel quite bad about being this slightly mad, eccentric, white Welsh guy trying to run this research group. But the key, as you'll see from the photo, is that they're all Africans that are doing the work. Pleasingly, 50% of them are female, which in chemistry is pretty good. And it's a real privilege to be working with these guys to try to drive this type of project forward. And thank you very much again for the invitation. <laughs>